And this morning I want to share a message that the Lord laid on my heart some three or four months ago for this Sunday. It comes to us from Matthew, the 16th chapter. We'll begin there in the 16th verse and read through the 19th verse. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. and I think it is pertinent to us this morning. Matthew 16 and 16, it begins like this. Simon Peter answered to Jesus and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Can we take a moment to praise God right there? I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning on this idea the Lord laid upon my heart. Built to last. Built to last. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you this morning. We've gathered in your presence, desiring to hear from you. And I pray, O oh Lord, this morning, my true Holy Spirit, come upon this preacher who is mere flesh and blood. And today, might the word of the living God go forth. Stir our hearts, O oh God. Stir our spirits today with your message, with your word for your church. Lord, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. He built it to last. Here we find Jesus use the word church for the first time in the New Testament. He gathered his disciples at Caesarea Philippi and he began to teach them and he asked them an important question. Who do men say that I am? And some would say he was John the Baptist. Some thought he was the prophet Elijah. Still others said that he must have been Jeremiah or one of the other Old Testament prophets that have come back to life. A man that could do all this. Surely he was some prophet like that. Yet in verse 16, Peter spoke up and said the most powerful words that have ever could be spoken when he said, no, I know who you are. You're not Moses and you're not Abraham and you're not any other prophet from way back when. No, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. And when Jesus heard that they understood who he was, he said, now that's something we can work with. That's something we can build on. That's something we can turn the world upside down with. And he began to talk about the church. And in these verses that we read together, he gives three characteristics, three things that he gives to the church of Jesus Christ. The first thing he talks about is the stability of the church. He does that there when he says, and I will build my church upon this rock. You see, the first idea here about stability is based upon who is building it. I've learned something. Not all things are built equal. The quality of the builder says a whole lot about the quality of the thing being built. You get some great builder, and we got a bunch of them in this church. We got Charles Ring back there. We see Mark Davis, so many others in this church. They can just build anything, and they'll build it, and it will last, buddy. You get me out there with a hammer and a few nails, you know what I'll have? You won't have something that'll last. You'll have a mess on your hands is what you'll have. <laughs> Who builds it matters. And Jesus knew, and God knew, a great number of people who were skilled at building things, that he entrusted to build things. When God wanted to build an ark, he called Noah to build it. When God wanted to build a nation, he called Abraham to birth it. When God wanted to build a tabernacle, he called Moses to design it. When God wanted to build a kingdom, he called David to raise it. 
Whenever God wanted to build a temple, he called Solomon to construct it. Whenever God wanted to build a ruined city, he called Nehemiah to rebuild it. God knows a great number of builders, yet when it came time to build the church, Jesus did not call on Abraham. He did not call on Moses. He did not call David. He did not call Nehemiah. He did not call Solomon. When it came time to build the church, Jesus rolled his sleeves up and he said, I'll build this one myself with my own hand, with my own blood, with my own effort. I will build this church. Jesus built it himself. And when Jesus built this church, he, he gave stability to it that we know that it would last and we know it would endure because he, he tells us it's not only a, a, about all that, but, but, but hear me, he says, listen, some other people get involved too. It's not just Jesus. We all get to participate in building the church. Ephesians 4 and 12 calls us to get involved in the work of ministry for the building up of the body. Now that means we get to get involved with the building that's what today we celebrated our ministry leaders in our church. We're so grateful uh, for our department leaders because they are the ones that Jesus is using. There's so many volunteers, like I said, that we're going to honor next spring because those are people that God is using to build the church. And I don't want to undercut that today, but can I tell you something? Anything we do to build the church, it is only because Jesus is working through us to build the church of Jesus Christ. Anything we do is because of Jesus. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, I can't preach a sermon good enough that would have saved some of you as lost as you were. Yet Jesus built the church and He took those words and before you knew it, you were standing at that altar with tears running down your face and forgiveness in your heart. Some of you were so messed up on drugs that a thousand different recovery meetings couldn't have saved you or changed you. Yet God started building the church and He took that little Bible study and He put the Word down in your heart and the next thing you knew, you were six months clean and your life had been changed because Jesus was building the church. Some of you got kids that are so messed up that a thousand services with Pastor Chelsea would not have fixed them. Oh, but Jesus started building the church and He took that youth service and He got the Word down in their heart and now they're not the same kid they were when they started coming to this church because Jesus is building the church. I thank God for leaders. I thank God for volunteers. I thank God for pastors. I thank God for all of you. But can I tell you at the end of the day, it is Jesus Christ that builds the church. It is His blood. It is His work. It is His power that enables enables the church of Jesus to be raised up. But it's not just who builds it that adds stability to the church, it's on whom it is built. For Jesus said this, upon this rock I will build the church. It's a play on words there. Peter's name is actually a variation of the word rock. And here he's now using a different word, a different variation of that word rock, to talk about a different kind of rock. Now, some people misunderstood that and thought that that meant that the church was built on Peter, that it's Peter's ministry, it's Peter's uh, apostolicity that, that is enabling the church to be built. And I just want to be real clear about that. Guess what? Peter is just as human as me and you. And if the church is built on Peter, we're in trouble because Peter, I saw what Peter could do. <laughs> just like me and you, he can make a mess of things. That's not the rock he's talking about. Yes, Peter's name is rock, but the rock that Jesus was building the church on was no other than the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not the person of Peter. It's the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Son of the living God. That's the foundation that the church is built on. Say, how do you know that, preacher? Because time and time again, the Bible tells me that He is our rock. Psalm 18 and 2 tells us that the Lord is our rock and our fortress. Psalm 62 and 2 tells us that He is our rock and our salvation. Matthew 21 and 42, it speaks of a stone that the builders rejected that has now become the chief cornerstone, talking of Christ. 
It tells us in Ephesians 2 and 20, it speaks of this chief cornerstone on whom the God builds the church of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 and 4 refers to Jesus as a living stone. 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 speaks of drinking water from a spiritual rock that is Christ Jesus. Hear me, friend. The rock is not Peter, and the rock is not Paul, and the rock is not any of us. But Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation, and it all stands on Him. What does that mean, preacher? It means that the church is built to last. Not just because of who built it, but on whom it is built. The church is not built on the sinking sands of man's accomplishment. The church is not built on earthly kingdoms that rise and fall. The church is not built on human personalities that fail and falter. The church is not built on political structures that crumble and change. The church is not built on popular philosophies that fade out with time. Oh no, friend, the church is not built on the sinking sand of our time. It is built on the rock-hard surface of Jesus Christ. On Jesus Christ alone I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And we are stable standing on Jesus. Now, where we get in trouble in church is when we forget who the foundation is. We forget who built it, and we forget who it's built on. I had someone a long time ago in the church I was serving at, that they left the church, and they told me they were upset about something. They told me, they said, Preacher, this church will never make it without me. He said, you see how much I give, you see how much I do, you'll never make it at this church without me. And I said, you know, I hate to disappoint you, but this church wasn't built on you to begin with. And you know what the Lord did? Let me just tell you that little testimony. You know what the Lord did that next month without their tithe, without their effort, without them being a part of it? Can I tell you we had the best attendance that month we had ever had at that church as long as I had been there? Can I tell you, get this, we had the best giving month we had ever had in the history of the church that very month. You know what I think happened? I think Jesus was busy building the church and he just wanted to make a point and say, oh, you think I can't do this thing without you? Give me that hammer. Give me those nails. I can build the church. <laughs> It's Jesus that does it, friend. Now listen, we're not trying to get rid of nobody. I'm not saying what you do is not important. I'm not saying what I do is not important. But at the end of the day, it's not what's ultimately important. For each and every one of us, if I'm not here, Jesus keeps building the church. If you're not here, Jesus keeps building the church. Yes, we serve Him and yes, we love Him, but we are not built on us. We are built on the rock surface of Jesus Christ and nothing fails with Jesus. Will somebody give Him praise for that this morning? But it's not just the stability. We thank God for that. But number two, we also find the invincibility of the church. Jesus goes on to say that this church is built on the rock that is Christ. And then he says, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Oftentimes you'll see this translated as hell. It's actually not the Greek word for hell. It's not the Greek word meaning fire and torture, what you typically think when you think of hell. It is the Greek word for Hades, which is the domain of death. That's the place where dead people were understood in that time to wait judgment. What he's saying is the domain of death. In particular, he talks about the gates of Hades. Now, gates were very important in the ancient world. That's where all the business was done. That's where the important transactions happened. And that was seen as a symbol of the power of a city was its gates. It would be like the White House would serve in our country. So when Jesus talks about the gates of Hades, he's talking about the white house of hell. He's talking about the powers of death. He's talking about the worst and the best that the devil would have to throw at us, that dominion of death. But of course, anyone who knows the devil shouldn't be surprised that he wants to bring death to the church. John 10 and 10 said he's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 1 Peter 5 and 8 tells us he's a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He wants to bring death. He wants to bring destruction to the church of Jesus Christ. 
Yet I'm so grateful here that whenever uh, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, He's talking about the church that's alive on the earth, Jesus wants to make it very clear that there is no power of death or no dominion of hell that can come against the church of Jesus Christ because the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Now here's why that's important. Because the disciples understood the dominion of death. They understood the destruction the devil wanted to bring into the world. Because Jesus gave this revelation about the church in Caesarea Philippi. A wicked, sinful city. In Caesarea Philippi, they had a cave where they would throw in sacrifices to the god Pan. In Caesarea Philippi, they built a temple to honor the emperor, Augustus Caesar. In Caesarea, they were wicked and sinful. They celebrated wickedness. They were thoroughly pagan and did not serve God. In this wicked place, catch it, Jesus made this statement about the church. He did not stand in the holy city of Jerusalem and declare that the church would stand forever. He did not stand in the holy temple and say the church would stand forever. No, Jesus stood flat-footed in the middle of Satan's sacred city and he declared that even in a city like this, the church of Jesus Christ will stand and the powers of hell will not stand against it. And that's good gospel news for us this morning. Because we live in Caesarea Philippi. We live in a place where the schemes of Satan are many. We live in a place where the dominion of death is knocking at our door. We live in a place that celebrates wickedness and curses righteousness. We live in a place that uplifts idolatry as people are chasing money and self and success. We live in times that are wicked. Yet, friend, I'm glad today that our Jesus stands flat-footed in a sinful city and says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. And in every generation, the gates of Hades, the dominion of death, has tried to silence the church, yet the gates of hell have not once prevailed. Amen. The Jewish authorities tried to kill Jesus, but the gates of hell did not prevail. The Roman authorities began to persecute the church but the gates of hell did not prevail. Islam rose and tried to eradicate Christians from the face of the earth, yet the gates of hell did not prevail. Amen. Communism began to push religion to the side and try to stamp it out, yet the gates of hell did not prevail. Secularism pushed Jesus to the side and said He was no longer needed, yet the gates of hell did not prevail. Global pandemic has tried to shut down churches. All but the gates of hell did not prevail. The domain of death has come again and again against the church of Jesus. Yet every time the church is still standing because we're not standing on the sinking sands of this time. We're standing on the invincible rock of ages and the gates of hell will not prevail. But it's not just the stability of the church, the invincibility of the church. Very quickly, this last thing. Number three, the authority of the church. Verse 19, Jesus said, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys, of course, are seen as a symbol of power, a symbol of authority that you can go where you need to go and do what you need to do. You have the keys, you have the ability to do that. Even in our uh, modern context, we find that that is still true. You might remember last year when, when Brother Lee retired from the lead pastor and role, the last thing he did was he pulled that key out of his pocket, the master key to the church, and he gave it to me, and he said, it's your problem now. <laughs> no, that's not what he said. He didn't say that. But he gave me the key, and that meant you can go where you need to go, you can do what you need to do, and you've got the backing of the church to do it. Amen. 
Yet when Jesus goes to get the church ready to go out into a wicked world, he does not give them keys to a palace. He doesn't give them keys to a city. He doesn't give them keys to a country. No, he says, I want to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven that you can go where you need to go and you can do what you need to do and you can trust that as you go, the power of heaven is behind you because you have the authority given to you by the rock Jesus Christ to do the work of Jesus. Jesus in the world. In particular, he says you have the power to bind things and they would be bound in heaven and loose things and they would be loose in heaven. In other words, you have the power, catch this, Jesus says, yes, the gates of hell will come against us. Yes, the dominion of death will try to destroy the church. Yet Jesus doesn't say to stand back and take it. Yet Jesus does not say, grin and bear it. No, Jesus said, it's time to fight back. Here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And you can loose things and you can bind things, not by your power, but by the authority of heaven. What that means is this, friends. Too many Christians today live defeated by the dominion of death in the world. I talk to people all the time. That they let the devil run rampant in their family, in their school, in their nation. And people will come to me and say, Preacher, why doesn't God do something about this? Frank, can I tell you the truth? God already has. Jesus went to the cross and he conquered death once and for all. Jesus built a church upon this rock and said it would last until the end of time. Jesus gave us the keys of the kingdom of heaven and said go out in the world loosing and binding as Jesus saw fit. Jesus said, listen, I've got an answer to the darkness of this world and the dominion of death. It's the church of Jesus Christ and I give you the authority to do the work of Jesus in the world. I tell you the point I'm at, I'm just fed up with the devil. I really am. I'm fed up with the gates of Hades coming against the church of Jesus Christ. And so I've just made up my mind that it's time for us to take those keys and put them to good use and just say, you know what? I'm going to bind the devil that would come against the people of God. I'm going to bind that spirit that would bring suicide upon our children. I'm going to bind those addictions that would try to tear families apart. I'm going to bind that lying spirit that would tell people there is no truth to be had. I want to bind that immorality that would say you can live any old way. It's time to bind the powers of darkness and declare there is hope on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. There is truth and power there. So friend, this morning we are not on the defensive, we are on the offensive. Called into the world with the authority of heaven and part of a church that cannot fail. Standing on a rock that will never sink. Would you stand with me this morning? Friend, you are built to last. Church of Jesus is built to last. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Would you bow your head with me this morning?